Hello, thank you for being with us today. I'm Ellie Witter with the Miami University Alumni Association. Throughout this year, we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of the relationship between Miami University and the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma. Today, we are joined by Susan Mosley Howard, Professor and Dean Emerita, who has worked with the Miami Center in various capacities for nearly 20 years, and most recently with our assessment team. Today's webinar is entitled, Examining the Impact of Language and Cultural Revitalization on Miamiaki. This presentation will summarize the findings of the assessment team, whose goal is to examine the impact it has on the Heritage Program students, participants in the summer educational programs, and the general community at tribal events. Before we get started, I want to remind you, mind all of our viewers that there will be time for questions throughout the presentation, so submit your questions with the link just below the screen. And now I will turn it over to Susan. Thank you so much for being with us today. Absolutely, thank you, Ellie. And welcome to everyone joining in on, on the webinar. Uh, as Ellie mentioned, Susan Mosley Howard and a member of the assessment team for the Miami Center. It's been a pleasure for me and an honor actually to uh, sit in on the session and to present the findings that we have accrued over the past couple of decades as it relates to the impact of revitalization on the Miami community and in particular on our Miami tribal students who come to Miami University. Uh, I want to admit that I am not the only one on the assessment team and so that the work that you're gonna be seeing is a result of the collective wisdom of the assessment team as well as the entire uh, Miami Center staff and most importantly, the tribal community members who contribute data, feedback and information that we as a team accrue. For those of you who have uh, watched the other webinars from Kara, George, Cam, Daryl, you heard a lot about the history of the people, uh, the Miami people in the region south, that kind of southwestern uh, region of Ohio. You've learned about the removal. You've learned about the growing relationship between the tribal community and the university. But I want to just speak a little bit uh, more particularly about the role of the Miami Center. As you all probably heard from Daryl, the, the Miami project uh, began uh, in, or he began the Miami project uh, in the late 1990s, uh, early 2000s. During the time of the launch of the Miami project, Daryl worked on uh, cultural revitalization projects, language uh, reclamation projects, and began the heritage program. And you'll hear a little bit more about the heritage program shortly. The Miami project became the Miami Center in 2013. And we amassed uh, an assessment team to look specifically at some of the questions that the tribal leaders and tribal community members were asking as relates to the impact of their revitalization efforts. So what our role then became was to embed ourselves in the Miami community to craft a research plan and an assessment plan that would look specifically at how is the community being impacted by the reclamation of culture and language. So during, throughout the presentation, we're gonna take a deeper dive into uh, these research questions and the process that we used to address them. So let's begin. The uh, overarching purpose of uh, our research is kind of captured in this statement here. The uh, tribal members kind of had this question of, you know, what, what's going on? And the purpose that they gave us for um, kind of launching the, the research was examine how we're reconnecting our Miami people to their indigenous knowledge system. Through cultural revitalization, the tribe aspires to help its community reconnect to its language, indigenous practices, and ways of living and knowing so that they can integrate those things into their lives today. As the Miami research team, we believed it was important to express the tribal leaders' goals in the Miami language itself. So we began the process of expressing the goals in the Miami language, and you see it there with this second quote. We then took that Miami language and retranslated it back into English, and I'll show you shortly why that's critically important. The purpose statement then is retranslated to mean 
we pick up some of the threads of our knowledge so that we will always remain together. So that's the exact translation of the Mia Mia language back into English. So you see a difference in reconnecting the Mia Mia people to their indigenous knowledge system to really meaning we pick up some of the threads of our knowledge so we will always remain together. So with this overarching focus in mind and this overarching uh, purpose, we began to look more specifically at a theoretical foundation in which we could frame our research. And what we decided was, um, well, first, you know, we are a kind of a collection of various uh, disciplines. We have a linguist on the team, psychologist, public health scholar, educational leadership scholar. But despite all of our different theoretical um, kind of um, foundations, we settled on a strengths-based model to ground this work. The reason this is important is with a deficit-based model, those kind of models focus on pathology. They focus on needs and problems, whereas a strengths-based model focuses on the opposite, focuses on resilience of the community. So we could all agree that this was a better theoretical foundation for this work than a deficit model. We wanted to highlight what are some of the features that the community can use in terms of the strengths, in terms of resilience, in terms of advancing wellness and wholeness as a result of their revitalization efforts. So we paired this framework along with a couple of other theoretical um, uh, foundations, namely social learning theory and uh, Broffenbrenner's ecological context. So that grounded theoretically our work. So with that established, we then moved on to develop research questions. And here are the four research questions that uh, we developed based upon the tribal communities questions about the impact of their revitalization. So those questions are, as you see here, one focuses on educational or academic attainment. The second focuses on well-being. And then we also began to look at levels of engagement and then a commitment to the continuance of the tribal community. In that first question, I want to again make that link to the Miamia language. We took each of these research questions and had it translated into the Miamia language, and then again, just as we did with the purpose, translated it back into English. Listen to the stark difference between what these questions mean in Miamia versus uh, in English. So the first question actually translates to mean, how does reflecting on our ways of knowing cause us to be wise? So with, within this translation, you see that educational attainment in terms of the Miamia way of knowing is connected with wisdom and striving. Striving for knowledge of self, striving for knowledge of culture and community, in addition to the kind of formal academic knowledge that we may think of. So is this kind of being wise that informs self about a knowledge system designed to affirm the very people from which it came? So that's really the essence of question one. In Miamia, the second question actually translates to, how does reflecting on our ways of knowing cause us to live properly and help each other? Question three translates to mean, how does reflecting on our ways of knowing cause us to be of one mind and one heart? And then that fourth question translates to, how does reflecting on our ways of knowing cause us to remember where we are from and to care for those who we have yet to see? So I'm going to provide um, Kind of, I'm going to give you the, the, the end of the story <laughs> and then walk you back through 
uh, how we got there. You know, there are some individuals, I'm the kind of person when I read a book, I like to read it from beginning to end and find out, at, you know, at the end, oh, this is how it ends. I have a friend who actually takes a peek at the end of a story and then she goes back and reads the whole story. I'm like, why do you do that? Just, well, I wanna know how it's gonna end. Then I go back and say, oh, okay, now I see how this unfolded. So I'm gonna give you a sneak peek to the end of the story. So the end of the, the story, the answer to the tribal leaders questions is our revitalization having an impact and how is it having an impact? Well, we discovered that yes, in fact, revitalization impacts in a positive way, educational attainment. It also impacts connectedness and well-being and engagement in a very positive way. And then revitalization also impacts this notion of giving back to the community in a positive way. So I will begin to unpack the answer to all of that. But before I give you the details, let me just pause and see if there are any questions about our research, uh, questions about the context that we're establishing uh, before I move into the data itself. Any questions so far, Kelly? Yeah, so I do have one question. Um, with the assessment, do you benchmark against other tribal nations at all? Very good question. We do not. Um, you will see shortly in our first data point, actually, uh, in terms of educational attainment, we have benchmarked against Native American students who are in colleges nationwide. Okay. So you'll see in a minute how we have used kind of uh, national educational uh, outcomes with all tribal uh, students uh, shortly, but not against a particular tribe. And specifically because the effort of the Miami tribe, you know, each tribal community is so different in terms of cultural practice and language and, and, and also their approach that they're using uh, in terms of cultural and language revitalization. So we do not benchmark against specific tribal communities, but that's an excellent question. Great. And then one other one, um, okay. is how far back does the research go? I know the heritage program has been um, in place for about 30 years. The relationship with the university has been 50 years, but Correct. how much is the actual research part of it? Correct. We launched our research team in uh, 2012. Uh, so our actual data gathering, our data points go back to uh, 2012. We do a comparison and you'll see that shortly in a uh, couple of slides from now. Uh, we do a comparison with the academic attainment of students who did not have a, an opportunity to participate in the heritage program, because uh, I'm sure Kara or others mentioned this, we've actually had Miami tribal students at the university for much longer than the heritage program itself. Yeah. Wonderful. I think we can continue on now. Okay, great. So let's start taking that deep dive into uh, the data. Okay, you see here, you heard me mention the heritage program and I know that uh, Kara also presented about our heritage program. You see here a, a neat picture of them. We have 43 uh, Miami students as of this fall uh, on campus. Uh, and first and foremost, I just wanna reiterate that this is truly a tribally uh, directed initiative that's intended to serve the needs of the community uh, and really uh, reach the goals that the tribal leaders have, have established. As an assessment team, we observe the planning of all of the programs that the tribe uh, and the educational committee creates. We um, then craft and conduct uh, measurement tools, of course, conduct our analysis, and then we present our findings to tribal leadership and to the educational team uh, for the tribe. This helps them to improve programming in subsequent years, uh, obviously, but we also share our findings with the scholarly community uh, at large. And at the end of the presentation, I will put up some publications that you can look at to further uh, examine some of the things that we've, we've published. But um, back to our heritage students, in addition to their uh, normal cor course load at Miami University, heritage students uh, take a rotating series of courses on language, uh, ecological perspectives, uh, Miami sovereignty, and then current issues as it relates to Indian country uh, in general. In their senior year, the Miami students do a senior project 
connecting their interests, most often connected with their major, but sometimes not. But they uh, do a senior project that connects something that they're interested in to a need of the tribal community. Um, we, we use a mixed methods approach um, to our research design. We use pre and post test interviews with our uh, heritage students in their first year and their senior year. Uh, we also use a measure uh, called the connectedness scale that was created by Angela Snowshoe. And we adapted this scale to uh, fit uh, the Niamia cultural context. We also use other institutional data like uh, the National Survey of Student Engagement to get a sense of the impact of revitalization on our heritage students. We of course um, use community and student observations. And we also use graduation rate data to quantify the impact of revitalization on our heritage students. When we look at research question one, that academic attainment or educational attainment, um, again, we're defining that broadly. We uh, found several themes uh, emerging. One is a growing sense of identity among our Miamia students. Uh, we also saw them beginning to integrate cultural practices to a larger extent. We also saw this growing sense of well-being, <clears throat> excuse me, and connection. And then we saw this sense of giving back to the Miamia uh, community in larger ways. For, so from uh, the data, we saw this growing and kind of increasing sense of commitment to the tribal community. So let's take a more intense look at question one, the results from question one. During the 1990s, you know, prior to um, the beginning of the heritage program, we uh, saw a graduation rate among Miami tribal students who came to Miami University. It was in the 56% range. And today, it's 92%. Uh, we um, also wanted to confirm that, you know, are, is this dramatic increase in graduation rate, is it really connected with the heritage program? You know, it could be something else. So to really uh, look at that, we did a logistical regression. And for those of you who are the quantitative folks, you know how important it is for us to kind of do a regression. And we looked at ACT scores, which you know, a lot of educational uh, researchers will say that at least first year college success is tied to ACT score. So that's why we chose ATC score, ACT score. And we also looked at heritage versus non-heritage uh, membership. So we looked at those as predictors. And through this logistical uh, regression, it was confirmed that the determining factor in the success of Miami students was whether they were in the heritage program or not. It was not tied to the ACT score. So you see here in this graph, over time, we uh, have been monitoring the actual six-year graduation rate of our Miami students. We looked at that rate prior to the heritage program, and that's why you see on the far uh, side of that left side of that graph, the uh, average graduate six year graduation rate for non heritage students. So these are Miami tribal students who came to Miami University um, before the heritage program. And then the rest of the graph deals with the six year graduation rates of our tribal students who actually are enrolled in the heritage program, that series of courses and other things that I mentioned. And then as kind of a control benchmark, we monitor the um, US Department of Education six-year graduation rates for Native American students at other four-year uh, public institutions. And you see that it hovers basically in the low to mid 40% uh, range compared with our, our students. So let's pause again. Any questions that you have about just the educational attainment data that I've presented so far? Yes, yeah, so one question um, that has come through is, how are these findings specifically with the heritage program shared with the university or like with student life, student affairs, um, 
Miami specifically, um, like how, how is that shared or is it shared? Yeah. So uh, as I mentioned, this is a tribally driven uh, project. Mm -hmm. So we share these results with tribal leaders, um, the education uh, committee or department, really the department of education for the tribe, not the U S department, <laughs> but for, for the tribe. Uh, and then we also, uh, as I'll show you at the end, we do have publications out there. We don't specifically uh, share these data with any other department at the university. Uh, we don't hide it either. It's, it's on our website, but we just don't have this intentional uh, sharing with others. I'm sure Daryl um, and Kara probably report these out as they need to with individuals uh, at the university, but uh, since the Miamia Center uh, itself, um, you know, reports to the tribe and is a tribal entity, uh, that's who we report our data to. Yeah, but very good question. Yeah. And then uh, I know Kara had spoken about this in the last uh, webinar that we had that mm -hmm. uh, the heritage program students and, and the, the students are quite literally all related. Um, and they have their family, they have all of them have family ties. So how does that family structure impact or does it impact um, the, the research and the, the connectedness? Because uh, it's, it's a much deeper connectedness than uh, it really is. A general student. It, it really is. And you're leading right into that next research question that we're going to get to. So I'll, I'll, I'll answer briefly now, and then you'll kind of see how we unpack that. But it's really uh, amazing to see um, just the, the, the familial ties. And it isn't necessarily, you know, like first cousins or second cousins or things like that, but they can all trace uh, ancestry to some common uh, relatives. So those kinship bonds, as we call them in the research world, those kinship bonds are, are strong. It also gets at the importance, and I'm kind of going to divert for just a second, but um, you know, it, it kind of gets at the importance of community and building community. Uh, among college students in particular, uh, one of the ways that this research connects with other uh, research as, as I look at other students of color on, on PWIs, predominantly white campuses, is the importance of a uh, sense of belonging and feeling those connections. And that's why many of the uh, culturally grounded programs created at PWIs in the 60s, 70s, uh, 80s, and, and throughout today are so cri still critically important and play a key role in the success of students who often may come to campus be underrepresented and feel like, is this a place for me? So um, that's kind of doing a little sidebar, but also related to the core of this kind of, of research uh, and why it's important for universities to be mindful of these kinds of things. So, so thanks for that question. Wonderful, thank you. I think we can continue on. All right, so next let's take a look at, um, the, the whole notion of engagement and connectedness, which uh, whoever kind of uh, asked that question, they're seeing into, to, into my next slide here. So over time, we did notice a, a growing level of connection, uh, you know, certainly to the tribal community, as well as to the Miamia knowledge system. Students reported their desire to learn more and integrate the Miamia cultural practices uh, into their lives. And so to measure this growing connection, we used, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, this connectedness scale authored by uh, Angela Snowshoe. And this scale has three subscales as well as an overall uh, score. And so I'll give you uh, kind of a look at this. So what you're seeing here, these are data that we collected from uh, 2017 through uh, 2022 with our current, uh, well, our senior cohort that just uh, graduated. And scores uh, from their freshman year, from their first year at Miami, are represented by the, the pretest scores. So that was really before they had actually gone through the heritage curriculum. And we compared those scores to their senior scores, which are represented by the post-test scores here. So what you see is the overall pre versus post-test dependent t-test the, for the full scale uh, shows significant differences as well as significant differences 
between those uh, subscale scores uh, as well. And so when we saw this, we wanted to zoom in on, you know, exactly what's contributing to this difference, you know, this pre-post difference. And so we zoomed in on some specific questions that we thought kind of brought this connectedness shift to light, at least for us. And I want to, I want to share those uh, with you now. This, so the, what you're getting ready to look at over the next couple of slides is we pulled out specific singular questions from the snowshoe connectedness scale, which uh, really kind of showed this stark shift from pre-test to, pre to post-test. For this item, we asked participants whether they you know, understand some of their Miamia language. And for our, our student population specifically, a large number of our students enter the heritage program having little to no knowledge of the Miamia language and culture. The language in our view is uh, one of the most significant means for transmitting cultural information as the language possesses cultural knowledge that is not likely to be gained through, through other means. So this shift to 100% in post-test was, was pretty uh, telling for us. The second question, I have an elder who I, I uh, talk to. Most people, most of our students come into the program without an elder, at least reporting that they don't have an elder who they talk with about cultural matters. Uh, and it's not entirely clear whether, you know, they just don't talk to elders uh, about these issues or whether they don't have an elder in their life to, to talk with. But what's critically important at post-test, the large majority of students have identified that there is an elder that they talk with about culture. And it's kind of bridging that gap between the elders who hold important cultural knowledge quite often, you know, are the knowledge bearers. So it's kind of creating that bridge between the knowledge bearers and the younger generation who can and we hope and hopefully will use that knowledge to benefit the tribal community. Another connectedness question that really helped us drill down into this big shift was that sense of belonging. And I just mentioned this in, in the discussion about why it's so important to have kinship bonds. Um, when students enter the heritage program, the majority say that they don't feel that they belong in the Miamia community. They report uh, in interviews with us that they know that they're Miamia. You know, they've of course been told that by a family member, whether it's parent, grandparent, or, or whomever. But at that point in time, um, that's the extent of, of the connection. But as a result of going through the heritage program that, you know, they have this growing sense of belonging to the community. It's grounded in their feeling it, knowing the knowledge system, learning the language and, and so on. So you see here the post-test scores, that dramatic increase and in strongly agreeing that they feel connected with the community. And then finally, on the connectedness scale, we asked how important it is for individuals to know their language. At pretest, uh, a large majority of the students disagree that um, it's even important to know the language. Um, many feel that the language isn't particularly relevant to their identity. But at post-test, this shift has occurred and the majority agree with the statement. And this is critical for the future of the use of the language is, you know, viewing one's language and feeling it's important will give them encouragement to continue learning the language. Now, the students uh, in the Heritage Program by no means leave the program fluent in Miamia, uh, but the goal is, and it's not really stress, that's not the goal is for them to become fluent, but the goal is to give them enough of a foundation where um, they have a commitment to learn more about the language and, and also uh, a commitment to begin to understand more about the Miamia way of knowing and way of, of thinking. So questions about, about that. Any questions about that sense of belonging, connectedness, and um, why we kind of drilled down into some of those questions to really understand what's at the core of this growing sense of connection mm -hmm. uh, to the tribal community and to the culture? One question a little bit different than that is, do you know if there are any Miamia students that are currently attending Miami 
that are not a part of the heritage program? We do, and that's probably a Kara Daryl question to, to my knowledge. Um, uh, the, the students that come to Miami University are a part of the heritage program, but that's probably a question for them. I know obviously, uh, you know, the, the students that are in our sample are obviously all in the uh, heritage program, but it, it is possible that there is a Miami tribal student on campus who is not a part of the heritage program. It's totally possible, but I'm not aware. Um, and then specifically with this year being the 50th anniversary of the relationship, there has been a lot of imagery on campus, messaging on campus. Um, have you seen that that has impacted our students' um, connectedness and perception of like sense of belonging when, I mean, I just saw the, the BCRTA bus has the Miami around, <laughs> uh, which is yeah. awesome to see on campus. Like, have you noticed how that has been impacting our students? Absolutely. Uh, I completed the uh, first year interviews in September. Uh, and then, of course, the, you know, the senior interviews in the spring. But especially this year in particular, the uh, tribal students have been really almost overwhelmed. It's, it's been uh, it's really added to that extra level of validation, appreciation, sense of connection. Uh, and many of them saying, wow, this is amazing, you know, that uh, the university is honoring uh, the tribal community, uh, making a concerted effort to commemorate the significant relationship and the importance of that relationship. So uh, what's gonna be interesting as we move forward is I'm already anticipating, you know, what kind of bump is this gonna <laughs> bring to our data? What kind of impact is this gonna have as we continue to uh, collect this, this kind of information? So yes, many of them have mentioned the significance of this year and how it makes them feel really proud. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, uh, it's great. Great. Um, one other question, and mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly where it fits, um, is we have, a looks like a, somebody in our teacher education program um, that okay. is working with K through 12 teachers and how can they help continue conversations about education, uh, about indigenous languages and culture? What is the best way um, for student teachers or teachers or the community to be able to help carry this message? This is a great question. And actually, I just thought of, of a good connection for uh, K-12 teachers or pre-service teachers, uh, those in training. Um, one of the Miami uh, Center staff members, George Ironstrack, has been, and, and others, have been working with school districts on helping teachers as they look at uh, the curricular options that they have or how they've embedded information uh, about uh, First Nations or Native Americans uh, in the curriculum. Um, so I think just uh, really educating oneself, uh, connecting with the resources that the Miami Center does offer to make sure that uh, as a K-12 teacher, you're not only providing accurate information, uh, but you're able to kind of avoid some of the stereotypes that sometimes creep into, uh, you know, curricular um, uh, lessons in not just K-12, but in higher ed as well. So I think just really being very intentional uh, and connecting with those resources is a good place to start. So I would encourage all pre-service teachers and teachers out in the uh, school districts to you know, connect certainly with uh, those resources that the Miamia Center has. Wonderful, thank you so much. I believe we can mm -hmm. continue on. Okay, so let's go on to the next uh, data slide here. Um, so uh, research question two, uh, focused on this notion of living well. And, and living well is um, kind of defined in terms of not just health-based notions of living well, um, but we've launched this new project and I'll give you kind of a little bit of information about it where we're beginning to look at what does it healthy living, wellness, quote unquote, living well, what does that mean in terms of the Miami knowledge system? And we, there's a cultural integration link here to what it means to live well. Um, some of the, we have some preliminary data though that gives us kind of a hint into how living well connects in this cultural context. We uh, learned from our students as well as the community members that living well or, or feeling well, being connected well, 
also is connected to their identity. Many individuals report feeling that uh, as they grew more connected with language and culture, cultural practices, it gave them sort of a foundation uh, to their identity. And they acknowledged that they were Miyamiya, certainly before they gained this knowledge, but they felt a deeper sense of what that meant after they gained this cultural knowledge. Many students describe the experience of using their knowledge and their values to cope with problems in life. They also said that they used uh, this growing sense of identity to feel closer, to de-stress, to uh, get through challenges. This connects with the World Health Organization's definition of health because the WHO connects health with community engagement. It connects health with resilience. It connects health with understanding how in community we can gain support uh, and support systems. So this growing body of literature is what we are using to fuel uh, a project that's been uh, funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, where we're looking at what does it mean to be well, to be whole in the Miamia way uh, of knowing. And here's a couple of other examples of how that manifests itself, this sense of well-being. You see a quote here from a community member who talked about in our interviews, the whole notion of feeling depressed or feeling anxious and, and finding it hard to cope, but then finding a sense of, of grounding uh, around the community, the tribal community. And then we also see another quote here from one of our heritage students where they uh, kind of commented on this being with a tribe is the first time they kind of felt like they were home and they used this notion of being connected to help them cope and to help them feel whole and healthy. Um, so as we embark on this Robert Wood Johnson um, grant where we're going to be talking with community members about what does it mean to, uh, to be well, to feel healthy, we anticipate that we'll be getting at more notions like this represented by these, these two uh, comments. Any questions uh, about this notion of living well, being healthy, what it means to be whole, and how it's connected with sense of identity, sense of connection, and sense of uh, belonging? Yeah, so there's a question that has come in, and maybe it's an inevitable question of how did COVID impact um, ah. research, and especially students being sent home um, in 2020. How how have those or how have those dynamics um, impacted the, the research and that feeling of health and well-being? Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the, the tribe would have gone through that as well, being sent home from work or or different right. things events right. canceled, what was, how, how had that been? Yeah, and we've actually heard a lot of uh, feedback from that, from our heritage students, as well as from the community as a whole. So um, imagine it, it not only impacted our heritage students on campus, but the tribe also runs summer programs for tribal youth. So for those two summers, we did not meet in person. It was a virtual, and you can imagine with children from the ages of five to 17 in these various camps, or, you know, it was, it was virtual. So the uh, Department of Education for the tribe had to scramble to revamp the curriculum to be able to, you know, deliver it virtually, uh, bringing parents into that, uh, you know, that deliverance as well. We also have uh, uh, summer experiences for adults. So it was just kind of re, you know, revamping the entire delivery. Uh, and then, of course, our heritage students reported it was hard for them not to be uh, you know, on campus uh, in person. They did a lot to stay connected, obviously, you know, virtually, um, socially, through their social media networks and, and all of that. Uh, but I, I can sense that with this year, with this added focus you know, on the tribal relationship, hopefully that's going to kind of erase and put all of the distance uh, of COVID, our COVID isolation uh, in the rearview mirror, just so to speak. But they did mention kind of missing those, those connections, definitely. Absolutely. 
And then another question, uh, really, so I know that there you talked about how you look at gradu graduation rate is one um, mm -hmm. data point. Um, so similarly, do you look at like mental health resources on campus or like the, the trends in um, student counseling, different things as a way to benchmark what the heritage program students are needing or utilizing on campus? Or is that even a data point? Well, that is a part of this new project that I mentioned, the Robert Wood Johnson grant on, on wellness and what it means to, to be healthy and, and well. All of those things are things that we're going to be uh, looking at, but within the context of what it means to uh, live properly or be well in terms of Miamia. So it's health, mental health, spiritual health, mm -hmm. uh, connection to community, sense of wellness, sense of belonging, all of those things in a real comprehensive uh from a comprehensive perspective is, is what we're looking at. So, so it, we're not isolating out, you know, diabetes or alcoholism rates, which, and I'm mentioning those because if you look at literature, most of the studies done on Native American populations look at those kind of dimensions. And that's important to know, that's important information, mm -hmm. but kind of going back to the very beginning of the presentation, that's one of the reasons we adopted this strengths-based model as opposed to the deficit-based medical model, which is, typically, and even in our field of psychology, is typically the model used where we look at the problems. Uh, so I'm not saying it's not important to know diabetes rates, alcoholism rates, suicidal, I mean, we have to know all of that. But if we really want to make sure a community is well and, and recovers and is strong, we wanna look at the strength space side. We wanna look at what is it, what are the attributes that create resilience, that create strength, that create sense of belonging. And that's the importance of this research agenda. And it's showing us that some of these cultural revitalization efforts need to be at the core mm -hmm. to make sure that communities survive and thrive and, you know, are resilient. Wonderful. Thank you. I think we can continue on. Okay. So let's take a look at our next data point. So we, um, as I mentioned, looked at levels of engagement. Uh, and so we noticed this increasing level of participation uh, on the part, not just of our uh, Miami students, but the tribal community as a whole. Let me go to this next slide, which might be a little hard for you all to see, but uh, let me kind of walk you through it. One of the things we noticed that is that, you know, in the early 1990s, it was hard for the tribal community to even get, you know, more than 30 to 50 people to attend some of the annual meetings. And the annual meetings are their governmental meetings where they elect their government officials and they take care of an important tribal uh, business. Um, and also another thing that we noticed in those tribal events is that often people would kind of mingle with others that they knew. But since that time, especially since the beginning of this concerted revitalization effort, uh, the numbers, not just in terms of the numbers attending the annual meeting, but numbers of tribal members who are attending ribbon work, cultural workshops like the ribbon workshop or um, language classes and winter storytelling and certainly the Miyamiaki conference, which occurs on uh, campus every other year. And if you take out the COVID years <laughs> where no one was gathering, the, the level of engagement among tribal members has just uh, increased dramatically. And you see here two um, student uh, quotes that, that we've listed here, which kind of show just the impact of being with community and the positive, um, just the positive consequences uh, of that. A couple of other um, kind of engagement and giving back uh, pieces. And I'm looking at my time and I'm running short. So I'm gonna go a little bit faster uh, that I wanna share. Um, our, one of the things we've tracked is just the level of connection of our tribal students to the tribal community. And as we've been um, gathering these data, we've seen just this strong commitment to give back to the tribal community. You see that the numbers here uh, too that I definitely wanna highlight is just the number of senior projects that connect to a tribal need. The number of our uh, heritage students that serve as quote unquote camp counselors at our A1 Zapata and Saka Jueta 
uh, camp experiences uh, is just just incredible. But this this growing sense of I belong to this community and I have a um, a responsibility and and I feel a need and I feel compelled to to give back. So that additional evidence of the growth and continuance of the tribe is um, is present there. The other thing that uh, we've noticed is this growing um, uh, commitment of, of adults to enroll their children in the community, uh, you know, the tribal, the tribal role. It wasn't always uh, kind of a, a given that um, a parent would enroll their child in the tribe. And we see now this growing commitment uh, to do that to the point where, you know, tribal membership is, is close to, to 6,000 members. So that's also a huge indication. Another quote here that I think really uh, kind of demonstrates this commitment to growth, basically at the, at the core of the student's comment is they view themselves, you know, we came in at this level and we really want to make sure that our children come in at this level, you know, a, a level higher. We really want um, our children to know more than we and to wind up with more than, than we did. And so I hear that repeatedly. We now have tribal students who have gotten married, who uh, have children of their own, uh, you know, been connected with this, with uh, this tribal community for 20 years. And so uh, we now see some of our heritage students who were at Miami University 10 or so years ago now have children and they're introducing their children to the culture, to the language, uh, sending them to the summer camps. So this growing commitment to continue uh, strengthening the tribe is definitely uh, in place. So to kind of come full circle and circle back to the very beginning uh, in answering tribal leadership's questions, are our revitalization efforts having an impact? Absolutely. How are they having an impact? They have had a positive impact on educational attainment. They've certainly had a positive impact on sense of uh, connectedness and commitment and sense of belonging. Uh, they've had, they're having an impact and sense of wellness and we're drilling down more on that research question with this new Robert Wood Johnson project where we're looking at sense of wellness and they're certainly having an impact on the commitment of our Miami tribal students as well as the community to strengthen the Miami nation uh, and to be committed to the continuance of this nation and handing it over to the next generation uh, even stronger than what they found it. So Newe, thank you for uh, having us uh, on and having us present our initial findings. And I'll put up this last slide if anyone is interested in further information. And this is also on uh, the Miami Center website. Uh, we have our articles there that uh, you can take a look at. We also have assessment briefs uh, on the website, which uh, kind of gives you some additional data that we're collecting as well. So final questions. I think I saved enough time for some final questions. Yes. So one is just a little bit more broad of how can alumni show their support to the Miami students in their educational and cultural journeys? Uh, what would be the best way for alumni to be involved? Well, I want to resist doing an infomercial, but I... <laughs> Um, I really think to uh, certainly become um, much more acquainted with the, you know, the activities of the Miami Center. Uh, I do know there are development opportunities. I'll divert those to, to Daryl uh, uh, and others, but uh, certainly to become more acquainted with the work that's going on there, reach out to Daryl and, and really just to ask, to offer to say, I want to support the work and what's the best way for me to, to do that. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. And then are there mentoring types of opportunities that happen between the students or even with um, members of the tribe that might be in Oklahoma or elsewhere to the, the current students? Are there reciprocal mentorship things that are happen? Uh, I know. And, and again, that's probably a Kara question, but I do know that there are some informal uh, mentoring opportunities that uh, Kara overseas. Um, if there are alum that are interested in more formal uh, processes, I would really recommend that they reach out to, to Kara 
Um, we're always interested in students getting a sense of support, um, you know, just in terms of career choices or uh, a sounding board, you know, I'm here to support you. So absolutely, I think that is something that Kara and, and the whole uh, Meow Meow Center would, would embrace. So right now, those opportunities are informal. In fact, Haley, who was going to do this presentation, um, uh, I served as kind of an informal mentor, you know, with her throughout her uh, career. Uh, and now she's a psychologist and, and professional and back working at the Meow Meow Center. So we always look for opportunities like that. Wonderful. I know you spoke about it right at the beginning, but how big is the assessment team and, and who makes up the assessment team? Absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned that because I wanted to introduce each member at the beginning and then kind of looked at the clock and said, let me get started. And uh, so, uh, but uh, so of course I'm on a team, um, Tracy uh, Harada Eds, who's from actually uh, a faculty member, uh, just retired, but at Kansas, uh, she's on our team. Haley, of course, who started out as a tribal student many, many decades ago, I can't believe it. And uh, now is um, on our assessment team and finished her doctoral work at, at Iowa State and has joined the team. Uh, Paul Branscombe from KNH is uh, part of our assessment team now, and he is playing a major role as we launch the uh, wellness project that I've mentioned several times. Uh, and so as a public health scholar, his expertise will weigh in heavily on, on that project. And at the very beginning of our process, um, before uh, Tracy and Paul joined the team, uh, I was uh, still on the team, but I was also joined by Kate Rumanier from EDL, who, so she and I launched some of the initial assessment work uh, way back when, uh, as we started this uh, assessment project. So uh, those constitute the members of the uh, assessment team. And we have also contracted um, program evaluation services from the Discovery Center. So they have joined us in helping with some of the program evaluation as well. So yeah, and you'll see the assessment team on the Miami Center website also. Wonderful, thank you. And then one final question. Uh, yes. I know this is very much so uh, centered with the tribe at this point in time, but just like the, the language work, do you foresee, or is there talks about this being expanded to other nations that are tribal nations that would like to to use this like framework of assessment um, for their for their growth. Excellent question, and absolutely. Um, and in fact, we have built into this most recent grant an opportunity for other tribal members to uh, kind of look at the framework that we've established. We're even creating a manual, which almost like a cookbook. You know, how did this happen? What process did the tribe go through? Uh, but the reason we're just kind of framing it in terms of a framework is because every tribal community is different. One of the most powerful dimensions of our assessment work is that it's very much tailored to the needs of the Miami nation. Uh, they guide the direction, they provide the, the questions, and then we as assessment folks walk alongside them as Nika, as friends and, and scholars to help them discover the answers. So we think one of the most powerful things that other tribal communities can do is to kind of come together as a community and decide what do we want to know about our tribal community? And then uh, they can look at the example of the Miami tribe to see what process did this tribal community use and then tailor it to fit their own tribal community. But excellent question. And absolutely, um, the work of the tribe is shared with other tribal communities. And I'm not sure if Daryl mentioned this, but there is an entity called Breath of Life mm -hmm. where uh, that he directs um, and where tribal communities get together and begin through um, archival work to reclaim their language. And so this is another venue that we'll use to get this information out as well. Wonderful, thank you so much. I think that is all the questions that we have today. So thank you so great. much. Um, this was such a wonderful and insightful webinar. Um, for everyone watching, um, this is a part of a series. It's a six part series. Um, the final webinar is scheduled for December 7th at 12 Eastern. Um, and we'll be covering the topic of language revitalization and the current language work. And all of these um, webinars are recorded, so you can certainly go back and watch, because I know we've referenced a couple of the other sessions um, throughout this presentation. So feel free to rewatch any of those presentations online. Um, and so on behalf of the Miami University Alumni Association, um, 
We thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your day. And thank you so much again, Susan. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.